Hi and welcome back to the rebuild of the Waltham and down here you'll see a close-up of the dial side of the movement. This is prior to assembling anything and what you can see down here is the balance uh, chaton uh, hole jewel and cap jewel assembly which fits into this hole here and is secured in place by these two tiny screws here. These need to be uh, pegged and cleaned and then refitted and oiled before we go ahead with the reassembly of the watch. The same needs to be done on the balance. And here's an extreme macro close-up of the cap jewel. And what I'm hoping to show you with this, if I can tilt this in such a way that I can catch the light on it. Hopefully you will be able to see it has the tiniest divot right in the center. It's very difficult to see on this because it is only slight in cases where it might be extreme and, uh, and a very noticeable burr that's been worn in there, then replacement of the jewel would be recommended. The first thing that's going to be reassembled is the keyless and winding section. So I'm going to move this out of the way a moment and we'll focus down here for you. And assemble the components that are going to make this up. Now the first components that we need to put together are these and this part here which will fit on at the very end. Some grease applied to the base of the pin. This will then be fitted like so. We then go to the sliding pinion and before fitting that we apply grease to the square faces of this one to all four faces, small amount and that will spread as the uh, sliding pinion locates and moves up and down on it. Now, obviously when I say a small amount, this is not a wristwatch small amount, this is a pocket watch small amount, which does differ because of course the parts are larger. Try and get that into an area where it will focus. So I'm just putting a small dot of um, uh, 8300, Mobius 8300 grease onto each face and we can then fit the sliding pinion. And as that moves up and down, that will spread the grease while it's in use. Next, we need to add the winding pinion and we have the same kind of situation where a small amount of grease is applied to the circular section, which is at the top. And you don't need to apply it all the way around because this will rotate and of course during rotation will spread the grease accordingly. It doesn't hurt to put a little dot here and there. So we fit that in place. And the final part is to add a small amount of grease to the base of this square section where the round piece is. And just applying that to the base of this. And slot that into place. Now, one of the benefits of doing this, of the, apart from the fact that we have to do this out of the watch in this case, but one of the benefits of doing this is the grease acts as a kind of natural glue. So as you can see, even with a bit of a vigorous shake, everything sticks together, which is quite nice. Taking the entire assembly and holding that in place, we can just drop this in a little bit like a jigsaw puzzle and it just drops into place. And then just check that everything rotates freely. The next thing to do is apply 
a little grease in the channel where the uh, the yolk fits. And I'm going to put a tiny drop of D5 onto its pivot point, which is actually a screw head just here. And D5 being a little easier to distribute around. Before I go ahead and do that, of course, I almost forgot I need to install this sprung section here that we mentioned, which fits in this little sliding channel. And to do this, I'm just going to apply a small dot of grease on either side before slipping that into place. To install it, slip in one side like so, and then with a finger holding that, just press down the other. Then we fit the lower piece, which is in effect the setting lever with the face here resting on the pin, which is inside this, uh, this tube here. And then the lower, the rear of that, the flat section bearing against this screw here. And then the two contact points meeting like so. Before fitting the spring and the securing uh, bridge uh, or the disc, as it were, we've add a small amount of grease to the contact points. And you need to locate one side into either the lower or the upper, whichever suits. And then you can either use a piece of pegwood or as here, using my finger to hold that, I'm just going to lock that in place. We then take the securing disc, pop that over the centre where you can see the screw hole, like so, and secure this into place. And you can see now that's under spring tension and will slide accordingly. What I'm going to do now while this is nice and secure, rather than risking it while it wasn't, is apply a small dot of grease on the contact faces down here. So on the rearmost section of this flat piece and on the face and pin down here with a little bit of judicious wiggling. Of course, this could also be done prior to fitting this, but you then have to try and juggle everything and keep it all in place. And if everything pings away, you've got to redo the whole thing again. But as you can see, that's now operational. Starting with the escape wheel, Place that carefully into its pivot hole. Next is the fourth wheel, which is distinctive due to its extended pivot for the small seconds hand at six o'clock. And accordingly can only fit in one particular way. Next we have the third wheel, which is not so obvious of the orientation, but it needs to mesh with the fourth wheel and second wheel accordingly. So if you think about how that will, how it will accomplish that, it becomes quite obvious the orientation it needs to fit. And finally, the second wheel, which of course fits here, but first I'm going to lubricate the shoulder of that with D5. Once the train of wheels is in place, we can take the train bridge 
and its three securing screws. The trickiest bit here is getting this to sit uh, correctly. You can see the pattern, you can check the orientation of how the bridge fits and see the pattern by looking at the jewel holes and the shape that the pivots make, the crescent shape, and it becomes apparent that it fits in this particular orientation. So. With a little bit of wiggling. Unlike a jewel or a ruby setting, a bushing can be a little bit more awkward to seat a pivot into. So even though I'm maintaining pressure on the bridge while I fit the bridge securing screws, there is, um, what I like to do is tighten the screws down until it just stops. So you're not applying any pressure and have another quick last check to make sure everything's free spinning before they are tightened fully. I am still waiting on the mainspring replacement coming, so I've just got the barrel assembled with the arbor in place without the mainspring currently, but this simply slides into place under the train like so, and making sure that this engages. The barrel arbor is lubricated lower and upper, and a small amount of lubrication is fitted onto here, and then the barrel bridge simply drops into place and is secured with its three securing screws, at which point you can test the rotation and ensure that it drives the train of wheels as intended. Next up, we're going to fit the click and its nice little blued spring. So we need a small amount of grease. As you can see, I've fitted the uh, barrel bridge screws here. So I'm just going to go ahead with the assembly as is and uh, just to demonstrate how this would go. So I need a small amount of grease on the post for the click. And this simply drops into place like so, and the screw on top. With that snug down, just have a very quick check to make sure that it's free to move. It's got a little bit of spring as it should, and that's absolutely fine. We then start to replace the winding components with this blued steel disc that you'll remember from the disassembly sits over here like this. Possibly the tiniest screw on the entire movement, this one. The crown wheel itself looks like this. You can see the teeth on the underside that engage with the winding crown. That just drops into place. We then need to add a bit of grease into here. This is where 
it will slip on the on the core which acts kind of like a bearing so put that in the center the bright polished decorative cover you can see it's uh, hopefully oh, if I can turn this over for you it's blued on one side and uh, black polished on the other very very high gloss polish this is fitted in the center to complete the decoration and then we can add the securing screw checking once that's secured that the crown wheel rotates freely following this in a very similar fashion is the ratchet wheel which as you can see is decorated with graining on the outside and a dished portion which is where the bright polished um, the black polished uh, decorative center cover is just moving the click out of the way so we can get that to engage and sit where it should again like the crown wheel we've got a blued finish on one side and a bright mirror finish black polish on the other and then a large securing screw both of these clockwise thread installing the pallets which as mentioned previously have had uh, the shellac applied to the jewel which did not have any uh, there is a slight difference in that jewel and I am a little concerned about how that might affect the performance hopefully it won't be particularly um, noticeable or bad but we will see in just a moment so placing the pallet bridge we'll go ahead and screw that down and we've got a nice free moving pallet fork at this point I'm going to pop this into the case and just give it a wind and then the next step will be lubricating the face of the pallet for pallet stones so we'll give that a full wind just have a quick test of the pallet fork interesting we have indeed got a bit of a skip on that side but that will need a bit of further investigation but otherwise we've got a reasonably good snap across Having fitted the pallets, uh, greased the pallet faces, 9415, uh, just for out of interest, is not technically an oil, it's, it's a grease. It's actually what's called a thixotropic grease, and it's, um, it has unusual properties. Uh, it's kind of almost like a non-Newtonian fluid, whereas it remains thick, but on impact, it, on impact, it spreads and becomes more fluid to provide more lubrication uh, but by its very properties it it has a tendency to stick better to the faces of pallet jewels um, and thixotropic properties are quite interesting if you um, just uh, google non-newtonian fluid and you'll see what i mean by the similarities uh, in non-newtonian fluid which you can make with corn flour or custard powder if you're feeling a bit flush um, corn flour obviously being cheaper 
However, next step is to fit the balance. Oh, I will mention as well, I had to make a little bit of adjustment to the guard pin on the actual pallet fork itself because that was leaving too much of a gap. So I had to bend this back out a little bit and then adjust it back in a little bit uh, so that it, um, it was close to the roller table and didn't allow it to drop uh, to, didn't allow the fork to drop one side or another while the balance was uh, was spinning, which it was doing originally. And I've also had to adjust this pin here very, very slightly just to even out the amount of banking and the, the lock on the pallet stones. There we go. Carefully checking that the carefully checking that the hairspring is underneath the second wheel. And using the pegwood just to hold the balance cock in place as it has a tendency to wiggle. I'm going to secure that down. And we've got an amplitude there of just under 180 degrees. I may need to make a little bit more adjustment on that guard pin. And the more I look at this, the more I'm convinced that that's not the original pallet for this watch. I don't think it's just a matter of uh, one of the pallet stones has been replaced at some point. The actual pallets themselves are not really in keeping with the whole, the overall uh, style and design of the watch and the quality. For this section here on the dial side, I seem to have lost the audio. I'm not entirely sure what occurred there, but it's entirely possible. I just forgot to switch on the lav mic. So uh, here I'm doing a voiceover, and as you can see, I've just uh, lubricated the post of the second wheel and fitted the Kenham pinion. We then do the same with the minute wheel. The dial side of this is as simple as it gets in terms of watches, and the intermediate setting wheel for time setting followed by its washer and securing screw Next we apply a bit of lubrication to the cannon pinion itself, uh, D5 in this case, grease would also work. And the hour wheel is fitted, lining it up with the pinion leaves of the minute wheel. That's the dial side works completed. So next up is fitting the dial, the uh, ena beautiful enamel dial, which is held in place with three posts here. I'm just loosening the dial feet screws a little as uh, um, I tend to tighten these up prior to them going into the cleaning machine so they don't work loose. And there I'd just forgotten to loosen them before refitting the dial. So holding the dial down with finger cuts, of course, this is tightened up. And then we go ahead and fit the hands. And again, very simple, um, as you have hour and minute in the center, and then the small seconds at six o'clock. 
So I'm just making a fine adjustment there. And this is an initial press on of the hands before I use the presser tool. Just to make sure that it doesn't stray from where I've set it. Same with the minute hand. And finally the small seconds hand. And then we can case the movement up. This is slid in from the front and it has to be sort of jiggled into place because it fits over the square of the stem which is fitted into the case. Once it's in place the front can be closed and snapped shut which will hold the movement in place and then we can fit the casing screws both the same length one at the top one at the bottom. And these are tightened up and at this point everything seems to be absolutely fine as you can see it's beating away nicely uh, it looks great but at this point I discovered that there is a problem with it after it's cased and uh, I will go into detail about that in the following bit of video. Hi and welcome back to the Waltham pocket watch and as you may have noted at the end of the last clip the entire watch was assembled everything back together it was ticking away quite nicely but on closing the case back and turning it over the watch came to a stop. I knew that there was some kind of problem the watch the movement was running great out of the case and in the case but the moment the case back was snapped closed it would stop. So I began a little bit of investigation as to what was stopping the movement and as you can hopefully see the movement does sit very slightly proud of the case back. I did at one point even consider that the case may have been um, a replacement different to the original. If you look at the back just up here, excuse the smudges and finger marks at the moment, they will all be cleaned of course. Here and here you can see uh, two scratches, indents, and they are from the screw heads for the crown wheel and the ratchet wheel. So my first thoughts were, is the pressure on there doing something to them? Is that something to do with it? So I first of all removed the crown wheel completely and it made no difference. Snapping the back closed, it still came to a stop. I, um, I tried tightening down the ratchet wheel. Obviously I can't remove the ratchet wheel because that's got to maintain tension. Tried tightening that down a little more than I would normally be comfortable with. Again, it made no difference. I then tried applying pressure with uh, a piece of pegwood all over various parts of the movement and the movement continued to run with the case open. 
the next thing I tried, this is quite a long winded saga, so uh, do bear with me please, because this is, this is one of those interesting things where, where you think you may have seen what the problem was, but it transpires that you didn't. So um, you're, you're aware uh, from the previous video that I had to reshellac one of the Palette Folk jewels. I, um, I had to adjust the banking pins because they were all out of whack uh, to, get, uh, to actually get it running um, correctly or uh, as it should and with the correct lock to lock. And I'd noticed that the balance staff is actually a homemade balance staff. It's been turned on a lathe, this one. This is not out of a packet, as it were. And one of the balance staff ends on the dial side was quite rough. So um, I'd noticed as well there was very, very little end shake uh, next to nothing. So I thought perhaps it's that, perhaps something's pressing on, on the balance because if you press on the balance, as you can see, it slows down and stops. So that seemed to be the obvious solution. So I, uh, I took out the balance, removed the hairspring or accessories, put that in the Jacko tool and um, I took a, a, a tiny amount off of the dial side end and reshaped that to get a nice curve. And then I burnished both of the pivots again, because it never hurts to do that if they need it. Uh, refitted it and snapped the back closed and it stopped again. So a little bit more investigation and poking and prodding. It looked as if the, um, not the uh, pallet folk, that was a different watch, apologies. That, <laughs> that was uh, on an old Longines. I had to uh, adjust the jewels for the pallet folk. So, I, cause I've got, I had sort of two with running problems um, at the same time, like waiting for a bus, as they say. And um, I'd noticed I had got an adequate amount of end shake. It was, you know, it was all fine. But I also then noticed that when I snapped the back closed, if I rocked the watch, I could actually hear the balance oscillate. Now, the problem with this one is there's not much in the way of view holes from the front. You've got your two little holes there for, through which you can oil your pallet fork. Uh, jewels, uh, your pallet stones, uh, but there's not a great deal of um, viewability through there. And you, normally you can see a balance if it oscillates or not, but I could actually hear the balance oscillate. So I knew that the balance was spinning and therefore by a process of elimination, I knew that it wasn't the balance that was the problem. So I had to look further back. It's not the pallets, the pallets are free, they're, they're well set and everything else. So I then started looking at the train and applying pressure at various points, I did notice that with a little bit of pressure at various points, it would actually slow down and eventually stop. So I've had to adjust the, uh, the end shake on the third wheel and the escape wheel. Uh, the fourth, fourth wheel was, was passable. I put it back together again, um, checked for freedom of end shake and what have you, tried it again, snapped the back closed and it stopped. And this, this kind of went on for a little while. I, I obviously, prior to this, I'd removed the dial and everything. What I then noticed after um, a lot of prodding and poking and because you're kind of working on guesswork, this is where an exhibition back would have been absolutely fantastic because I could have seen what was going on through there. Obviously once that's snapped you can't see a thing. So what I did notice is uh, is once I'd got this all back together, uh, if I poked at the escape wheel pivot on this side it would start running again but only briefly and then it would stop again. And as you moved it sort of back and forth and what have you, that would, uh, from dial to, to back, that would uh, have an effect. So then I opened the case back up and started prodding at the um, escape wheel pivot from this side and noticed that there was actually quite a bit too much side shake on it. Obviously just wear through the years. And it seemed that if it was nudged over a certain way, it was either binding with the train of wheels 
or it was perhaps just catching elsewhere, maybe on a rough burr or what have you, which was slowing it down enough that it would eventually stop. So what happened next is um, the watch was uncased, it was the bridge was stripped and using my uh, staking set and an appropriate um, domed stake, I had to close up the hole and then using a smoothing brooch, uh, which very tiny one that you can see there, using a smoothing brooch I just uh, took that hole out again, burnished the underside where the pivot sits and, uh, and checked that for size and fit, put it back together and to my utter delight <coughs> when I um, snapped the case back closed and flipped it over the watch continued to run so this has been a really really tricky one. What I'm going to do now is to try and show you the um, the difference obviously so um, and you have to view it through these little holes here so what I'm going to do is uh, zoom in so it's a, an up close macro and uh, we'll take a look at that back in a second okay this might be a little bit tricky because I'm having to hold this by hand up in the air underneath the camera so here you can see we've got the balance oscillating chugging away nicely there and then this case back I'm going to snap this closed. I'll just try and show you the front so you can see. Hopefully you can make out there the escape wheel rotating through those holes. So very tight case back this as well. There you go, heard that snap there. And hopefully if I can get that up into focus and we can see that that's now running. So I'm absolutely delighted with that. Um, snap the outer cover as well. Oops, let's get that, sorry, get that in focus for you again. So what's next is uh, I need to uncase this, uh, strip it all again, run it through the cleaner again reassemble re-oil with fresh oil because it, it has to be um, all fresh and absolutely right of course because it's been apart several times and uh, and then refit the dial hands and everything case it up and leave it sitting on test for a day or two and then it can wing its way back to the owner so this has been a little bit of a long one and uh, but hopefully you've enjoyed it so uh, I will add a couple of um, a couple of video clips at the end of it running for you and, uh, and there we go. Thank you for watching. We'll see you in the next video.